Pēc Ziemas karu nepievienošanās politikas desmitgadēm Somija gatava iestāties NATO. Kas mainīsies visā Baltijas jūras telpā? Somijas ekspremjers, Eiroparlamentāriets un baņķieris, tagad profesors Aleksandrs Stups, viens pret vienu. Mr. Stup, it's a pleasure to have you on Latvian TV. Thanks for having me. Always like to be on Latvian TV. Nice. And actually, Finnish parliament just now voted for application towards NATO. How big this step is for Finland? Well, I think it's a long arch uh, in our Western integration. Of course, it's a big step. Some people call it historic. Uh, perhaps it is that, but the vote was 188 in favor and eight against. I think that's historic. And had someone asked me four months ago whether this would happen, I would have said absolutely not. What has changed? Uh, Putin. <laughs> so basically, I think the Finnish NATO membership was decided on the 24th of February at five o'clock in the morning when Putin and Russia attacked Ukraine. Uh, and that's when the opinion polls changed from usually 50 against, 20 in favor to 50 in favor, 20 against. And the latest opinion poll was 76% in favor of NATO membership and 13 against. I predict that now that the parliament has voted, the president, the prime minister and the government have given their positive uh, positions, we will see opinion polls over 80%. So. This enlargement, both Finland and Sweden, uh, will basically be thanks to Putin. That's why NATO will get its 31st and 32nd member. Mr. Stup, you as a politician has been advocating, uh, have been advocating this membership for decades, actually. Um, the majority of political elite in Finland were thinking differently. What was the reason? Well, it's difficult to say. I've been an advocate of Finnish NATO membership since the early 1990s. I felt that it would have been good to take care of both our economy and politics in the EU and then our security in NATO. But, you know, there was such a long tradition of neutrality during the Cold War that I think people were afraid to join NATO. And it was also a question of public opinion. You see, I don't think we would join NATO was it not for a full reversal of public opinion. So I was very much in the 20% uh, minority and people felt that, you know, it's enough to have a strong independent military, it's enough to be members of the European Union, and it's enough to be uh, a close partner to NATO. We don't need to take the final step. I think this was probably the, the reasoning of a lot of politicians in Finland for 30 years. I was reading the Guardian's article about the mood in Lappeenranta. This is a Finnish border town, and here is a quote. Finns aren't very open about their emotions, but what is happening in Ukraine has brought up sentiments that seem to have been kept inside for decades. How do Finns perceive the war in Ukraine? Well, I think there is an emotional attachment, and I think the linkage is very much to what we experienced in the Winter War, 1939-1940, and in the War of Continuation, which ended with an uncomfortable peace with Stalin in 1944, when we lost pretty much 10% of our territory, Viborg, big city, and, and second biggest city in Finland, and, and Karelia. Actually, my grandparents were born there, and my dad was born in Karelia as, as well. So there is this sort of emotional attachment that we understand what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, and I think, you know, the reaction of the Finnish public has been a combination of, or what I call rational fear. So it's a rational, logical conclusion uh, and an element of fear. And the feeling is that, okay, if Putin can uh, slaughter his Slavic brothers and sisters uh, in Ukraine, there's nothing that will stop him from doing it elsewhere. And we never want to be alone again as we were in World War II. So this is the emotion that I think the Finns are now showing. But I think it's a very rational emotion and an extremely good logical conclusion. This was heroic fight against more powerful enemy. 
what lessons of the winter war should be learned nowadays by professionals, militaries in Europe, in Finland, in Baltics? Yeah, I guess you could start by saying that uh, the, ra the rations were roughly the same. So let's say, you know, one Finn to ten Russians. And then if you look at the military equipment, the Russian one was much more sophisticated and there was plenty of it. I mean, we sent our men and women to war with, uh, you know, lacking equipment. Uh, but then we did get some supplies. Now, what's the lesson to be learned? I think the lesson to be learned is that when you're defending your country, it's about your existence. That's when you put up a heroic fight. And if you're able to do it in the form of guerrilla warfare, you can make it last for a long time. And that is linked to the other lesson. If you're attacking a country and you don't really even know why you're doing it, like some of the kids that were you know, sent apparently to do just a military exercise in Kiev, and then suddenly they start dying, uh, you, know, you get a little bit confused. Uh, a final lesson is that, you know what, democratic militaries do a hell of a lot better than authoritarian militaries, because in democracy you're free to make a choice in your team, whereas clearly in an authoritarian military like the Russian one, the command structure is so rigid that you're not able to think creatively. So I think this has been a massive embarrassment for the Russian military. After Finland and Sweden join NATO, how does it change the, the, the security landscape, uh, let's say, in the Baltic Sea region? Makes, makes Europe more safe. And here, you know, I, I, I want to begin by thanking Latvia, uh, Lithuania uh, and Estonia for joining NATO in 2004. I, as a Finn, understand that you joining NATO made the Baltic Sea region much more safe and secure. And the same thing is going to happen now that Finland and Sweden join NATO. So for us, this is a win-win for the Nordic countries, the Baltic countries, the Baltic Sea region, Europe, uh, and the whole alliance. And of course, to be honest, yes, uh, NATO will get 1,340 ki more uh, bo kilometers of border with Russia, but at the same time, from the Finnish perspective, you will get 900,000 reserves, 280,000 that we can mobilize in wartime. You'll be getting 90, uh, sorry, uh, 62 F-18s, soon 64 F-35s, one of the most sophisticated uh, uh, air-to-land missile defense systems and land-to-air systems. And on top of that, a country which is more NATO compatible than most NATO states. You add on to that that Sweden has 90 JASM uh, planes, uh, ja and, and, uh, 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 JAS planes, and on top of that, a very sophisticated Navy. So this is very much a win-win, I think, uh, for our part of the world. A bit more about your defense system, let's say. In Latvia, conscription was abolished, and since then the regular force uh, consists of only professional soldiers. Or in Sweden, they try to deactivate conscription and then de reactivate it again because of lack of volunteers. In Finland, uh, universal male conscription is in place and for many years. Why it has seemed the most appropriate option for Finland? Well, many reasons. One is that Finnish security policy is always, you know, uh, based on a careful balance between idealism and realism. So the idealism is that we bona fide have felt that we should try to cooperate with Russia, that trade uh, and interaction leads to the Europeanization or the Westernization of, of Russia. Uh, but on the balance, we've also understood that from our experience in history and geography that, you know, Russia can be an aggressive, revisionist and imperialist power. And that means that you have to have a strong military defense in order to be able to protect yourself on a rainy day. And of course, now that the rainy day came, uh, we are pretty good uh, in deterring a Russian uh, attack because they are very well informed about the size of our military. So, uh, you know, with the wisdom of hindsight, it was very smart that we did not run down our military or compulsory military service in Finland. So I did mine in 1988. Uh, my son is going to do his next year. And, and this is, you know, a normal part of, of the life of a Finnish man. But fortunately, nowadays also a possibility for women 
uh, to do their military service. And of course, now with this war in Ukraine, you know, I think there'll be a lot more popularity for the whole idea. Uh, a grave mistake. This is one of comments com comments coming from Kremlin. Can you anticipate um, any counter steps uh, from Russia? Well, I think the grave mistakes was that the Kremlin attacked Ukraine. <laughs> you know, if if Putin had not attacked Ukraine, Finland would not be a NATO member. So the sequence went: Putin attacks, the Finnish public changes opinion, the Swedish public changes opinion, the Finnish government changes opinion. The Swedish government changes opinion, and boom, we go into NATO together. Uh, and our president put it very well. He said, the only place that needs to look into the mirror is President Putin and the Kremlin itself. Do we expect a reaction? Yes, some form. So far, it's been quite moderate. We don't expect uh, a reaction in terms of you know, conventional warfare, but we'll probably see some hybrid action. It could be on cyber attacks on home pages of our ministries, it could be an attack on, 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 say, our financial system or banking system. Um, you know, there'll be violations of Finnish airspace. Uh, and, of course, information war as well. So in the next few days or weeks, you'll end up seeing a lot of disinformation floating around in Latvia about Finland. You know, you saw things like uh, the Swedish author of Pippi Longstocking, Astrid Lindgren, being called a Nazi. So, you know, or then you'll see Medvedev saying, we're going to move nuclear arms to the Baltic Sea region. And we say, well, you know, Astrid Lindgren was not a Nazi and you already have uh, the nuclear weapons around the Baltic Sea. So please, uh, next. <laughs> so okay. this kind of stuff. Thank you for your, let's say, calm explanation. But it seems that Putin achieves uh, the opposite. He, uh, he declared to push NATO away, etc., etc. What's going on? What's the Putin's uh, mistake? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's hard to say. I think he probably mixed tactics with strategy. And I think his basic assumption was that, you know, after Georgia, he got what he wanted. After Crimea, he got what he wanted. And he thought that he would be able to do the same thing uh, in, 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 in Ukraine, and especially with Kiev. But he did not understand that his military was so incompetent that they were not able to take over Kiev in 48 hours and the Ukrainian people were so heroic. So what he tried to do, he achieved exactly the opposite. So number one, he will see now the Europeanification of Ukraine. Number two, a reunited European Union. Number three, a rejuvenated transatlantic partnership. Number four, NATO with a new purpose, not very sim dissimilar to what it had in 1949 as a repellent towards the Soviet Union. And number five, Finland and, and uh, Sweden joining NATO. So from his perspective, everything has gone wrong. Uh, and this is, uh, this, this is the reality of the situation. I mean, you know, of course, Russian disinformation can try to twist it and turn it. But looking at it from the West, uh, he didn't do very well, did he? One more Russian tool, uh, energy. And is Finland ready to uh, abandon Russian energy? I mean, gas and ele yeah, electricity, no even if it means rising costs? Yes, I mean, and it's already happening. You know, on last week on Friday, the Russians turned off the electricity. But we're not dependent on the grid coming from Russia. That's why we have a Nordic grid. Uh, you know, 5% of our energy portfolio is gas. 100% of that gas comes from Russia, but it's only for our industry and we can switch it to nuclear anytime. So, you know, we prepared for this day and we don't have a problem at all. Uh, as far as oil is concerned, what we do is we bring in crude oil and then we refine it. Well, we can get the crude oil from elsewhere and refine it. Now, of course, it's going to be more expensive, but, you know, that's the price that you pay for war. That's the price that you pay for, for peace. And I, I think this is one of the things that, our political leaders, both in Finland and, and then in Latvia, they have to communicate that we pay a price for this war. And the price that we pay is higher energy prices, higher food prices, and actually lower welfare. Uh, but it's a cost that we simply have to be able to cope with. And the cost is much lower than what we're seeing in Ukraine at the moment. Coming back to Finland's uh, NATO application, uh, Turkey's President Erdogan say he will not approve Sweden and Finland joining NATO. Is it serious or it's just 
kind of political game to gain some dividends for Turkey? Well, you know, we Finns are cool, calm and collected. So uh, we listen to what has been said and then we try to sort things out. I guess the first reminder is that Finland was instrumental in setting off the EU accession process of Turkey. Actually, during the Finnish presidency in Helsinki summit meeting, European Council in December 1999, I was a young note taker, or actually using the laptop, uh, and, and, and taking the notes from that meeting, and I still recall it. So there is this sort of bond, and the Turks understand that Finland has always supported Turkish membership in the EU. Of course, we understand that things haven't gone as planned, uh, but that's how it is. Second observation, you know, NATO is also about domestic politics. So, you know, we have to understand that there are elements of, of domestic politics in this, you know, elections possibly in 2023 in, in Turkey, and there needs to be some tough language. My final observation on this, I, I believe that NATO itself will be able to handle these types of situations. Yes, we can do some bilateral uh, mitigation, but I, I think it's the job of NATO to have those conversations. And I, I trust that the strategic partnership between the United States uh, and Turkey is, is very close. So uh, let's not run after every piece of news uh, and, and believe. I also believe that these things can be sorted out. So. We stay quite calm. Let's see. Ukraine is paying a high price and keeps fighting hard. How do you evaluate um, this war so far for Ukraine? Well, obviously, it's been a heroic effort. Um, and that's what you know happens when you are defending your country and, and your own existence against uh, a grand aggressor who is blatantly... Um, breaking uh, international law and uh, actually engaged in war crimes as well. Uh, the important thing here is that the West uh, stands behind Ukraine. And that, of course, means, you know, not only political solidarity, but far-reaching economic sanctions uh, towards Russia. It also means financial support, armament support uh, to Ukraine for it to be able to, to fight back. Now, I'm not a military expert, so I don't know what the end game is, is going to be. But at this moment, it seems quite clear that Russia will never uh, achieve what it set out uh, for in the beginning, which was basically to take over, if not all of Ukraine, at least Kiev, and set up a Russian-style puppet government that throws, throws Zelensky out. And at this stage, we already know that this is not going to happen. Now, we don't know how far the Ukrainians can push back in terms of the Donbass region, Donetsk, Luhansk, you know, Odessa, Mariupol, uh, and the rest of it. But uh, I think we're looking at a conflict which could last quite a long time. We're into 80 plus days now. The Finnish winter war lasted 105 days, and I'm afraid this one is going to go on for, further, for longer than that. Do you see possibility for ceasefire? Are you want to see the this war is going on uh, how far ukraine ukraine can go because some western partners will start to insist on peace negotiations but some says it's very very bad advice for ukraine yeah i don't see a ceasefire agreement uh, anytime soon and, and the reason is very simple the, the two warring parties or actually the aggressor and the defender are so far away from each other that a ceasefire would be, be difficult. And I say this with some experience because I was foreign minister and chairman of the OSC in 2008 during the war in Georgia. Uh, and I brokered the ceasefire together with Bernard Kushner. I mean, uh, President Sarkozy took the credit later on, but the ceasefire agreement was written on my laptop. Uh, and there, we were able to do that in five days with five or six clear points about territorial sovereignty, withdrawing of the troops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But right now, I, I just don't see there being space for this type of a ceasefire agreement. Um, and a lot of times we say that, you know, peace emerges through peace mediation. And I want to believe in that. But to me, this looks like, you know, peace will emerge with defeat. Uh, and, um, you know, or at least a lie about a victory. So I hope the sooner the Russians 
uh, lie about their victory. In other words, say that we achieved our goals and the sooner they can let down their arms, uh, the better. There are statements that we need uh, to help Putin to save his face. What do you think on these statements? How can he save his face? You know, I mean, <laughs> it's uh, of course I, you know, I understand that in Russian there are two words for the for word, the word of truth, and uh, one of them is tactical truth, which basically means that everyone knows that you're lying, but you're lying for the common good. I mean, if if that's the way that he can save face, that's fine. But I mean, how can you allow someone like that to 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 save face? You know, he has attacked an innocent country. Do you... uh, he has violated all, all international law, territorial integrity and sovereignty. If you allow him to do this in the future, I mean, you know, war is just going to escalate. So I, I just don't know how you can make Putin face his safe, face, uh, save his face. Do you consider Putin a war criminal? I, I'm not qualified to give you an answer to that because I don't do international law. And I would prefer for international tribunals to, to deal with that. Because obviously, if I say something, then there's going to be a headline that, you know, Professor Alexander Stubb, former prime minister of Finland, is of the opinion X, Y, and Z. And I just don't feel like I have the competence to say that. I let the professionals do that. But obviously, we're in a situation whereby Putin uh, and uh, Russia and his government and his military are slaughtering innocent human beings, women, children, and men. Uh, and you have to ask your question, you know, where, where is the limit? Uh, but there are many different ways, from what I understand, in international law to define war crimes, but I'm not, I'm not qualified enough to give you that judgment, I'm afraid. As a politician, uh, you have met Putin. Where is his limit? What are he going to do with the leadership of Russia and with the future of Russia? It's difficult to say, and, and the reason for that is that, uh, you know, this is more about his legacy than anything else. It's about his slightly strange vision uh, of a historic Russia, which has one language, Russian, one religion, Orthodox, and then one leader himself. And he sort of is looking at this as a former superpower, uh, it's power nostalgia. He's very revisionist in his thinking. And, and he wants to sort of establish himself as one of the great you know, Russian leaders next to Stalin. And this is one of the big problems that we don't understand in the West, that you know, Germany was able to deal with its past. You know, it, it condemned Hitler and, 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 and national socialism, in other words, Nazis. But you know, Russia never dealt with its past properly. Uh, you know, we have to understand that Soviet communism killed, uh, by a conservative account, over 20 million innocent human beings due to kulagization or starvation or, or, or purges. And, and, you know, when you haven't been able to deal with that in your history, it's, it's very difficult to know where the limits are. And that's why I don't know where Putin's limit on this is. How do you see uh, the future of post-war Russia? I think this is an extremely important question and something that we need to start thinking about. Because obviously we were not able to integrate Russia to the West in a way in which we wanted or in a fashion that we wanted after the Cold War. I mean, there was this period in the 1990s when, you know, Russia went through hypercapitalism and sort of uh, had withdrawal symptoms from, uh, you know, a collective and an and, and, and organized economy. Uh, and politics was a little bit all over the place. That's usually what happens in disruption. And I, I think there was a moment when uh, we could have actually brought Russia quite close, uh, you know, to the West. I mean, even the NATO, Russia NATO Council was created in, I think, 2000, 2001, lasted until 2014. But then things turn around and, and, you know, Putin gave up on the West, if you will. And we, we have to avoid the same mistake. I mean, uh, we know that Russians are extremely insecure. Um, uh, you know, we, we know that they are very resilient in, in tolerating discomfort and, and pain. But, you know, we need to find a pathway back for Russia from this war. Uh, but that planning needs to happen now 
Uh, but obviously, right now, you know, there's nothing we can do. Russia is going to be completely and utterly isolated. But after the war is over, after reconstruction begins, we need to start finding a pathway back. What it's going to look like, I have no idea. And what could be the ultimate goal of EU and Western sanctions towards Russia? How long they must keep the sanctions in place? I don't have that crystal ball, but uh, at this particular point in time, I think we need to isolate Russia totally. That means political, economic, financial, sports, culture, transport, energy, uh, all of these things. So Russia needs to be basically cut off from the West because at the moment we're unfortunately feeding the Russian war machine. Uh, by still exporting uh, oil and, 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 coal and, and, and gas, and that needs to stop. Uh, so you, but usually sanctions, they begin to hit, hit when you know that they're hitting yourself as well. So we're approaching that, that moment. Um, so I think the sanctions are going to last for a long time, certainly for as long as uh, you know, Putin and the current government is, is in power. Uh, cutting Russia from the West, uh, what is uh, the role of China in these cir circumstances? Do they have the tools and maybe um, the will, will to persuade Russia? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, I think uh, China feels a little bit uncomfortable with the war because President Xi Jinping, he would like to focus on two things. One is zero COVID policy, which obviously is failing because you can't contain a virus. Uh, and the second one is the upcoming party congress sometime in, in, in uh, October or November. So this is a bit of a thorn in his side. He wants to focus on domestic politics. And as we know, this war will have you know, global ramifications in terms of supply chains and food and, and price of energy, etc. So it's an uncomfortable moment. Uh, in the beginning, some people felt that, you know, China and Xi Jinping will pivot towards Russia, but I don't believe in that. Of course, what Russia will, uh, China will do is, is to fill the power vacuums on sanctions. So it will create dependencies in the Russian economy by helping out. But the Chinese are not dependent on the Russian economy. You know, for them, the relationship with, with Russia is not a necessity. Uh, it's just there. Whereas for Russia, it's a lifeline, you know. <laughs> They have to get help uh, economically from, from China. And, and China will be very careful in, in making sure that they don't get hit by secondary ch sanctions. So, you know, China will be sort of oscillating, a little bit neutral uh, in between the two. Hmm. And before the war started, um, uh, the French President Macron suggested that the Finlandization of Ukraine was one of the options on the table to solve this um, crisis before, uh, before the war. How do you think, does he understand what Finlandization means? And uh, how do the Finns perceive this term Finlandization nowadays? Well, you know what? The Finlandization means EU membership and NATO membership. Then I'm all for it. But I don't think probably that's what Macron meant. No, I mean, Finlandization is, is uh, in our uh, foreign and security policy discourse, it's a bit of an insult. It's a very uncomfortable time in our history. It's a term that was coined in 1966 by a German professor and essentially meant that we had to compromise our values. And we had to do that on many accounts. Number one, we couldn't be part of the international institutions where we wanted to be because of the Soviets. Number two, we were not able to uh, really uh, be a democratic state, including having free speech. So we couldn't publish Alexander Solitsenichin's Gulag Archipelago. That had to be published in Sweden. And then number three, uh, the Soviets were meddling with our internal politics. That's why we had a president for 24 years in the form of Urho Kekkonen. So that's the last thing that I, I, I want to impose on any country, uh, including Ukraine. And, and this is where I think that the realist school of international relations, the Mersheimers of this world, have gotten it completely wrong. You cannot appease yourself to the heart of Putin. The only thing that Putin understands is power. Uh, and he's seeing that right now coming from the Ukrainians. So is Finlandization old school style an answer for Ukraine? No, but if Finlandization means EU membership and NATO membership in the long run, then yes, it's an answer. Okay. Uh, about Ukraine, what do you think? If Ukraine wants, 
um, they must have a chance to apply to NATO membership? Uh, I think, you know, in the long run, probably. The, the, the vision that I have is that first you have to understand that this wasn't about NATO. This was about European values. Putin hates Western liberal values. He hates freedom. He is a conservative authoritarian. He hates democracy. And that's what he was trying to prevent happening in Ukraine. It wasn't about NATO. Now, NATO is, of course, important. Now, I think we need to start thinking about the future of Europe in the following way. Europe will be divided into two. On one side, you have an authoritarian, revisionist, imperialist, aggressive Russia. And on the other side, you have 40 European states, starting from Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, all the way through to the British Isles. And you have three categories of countries. You have those who are in the EU, and most of them nowadays in NATO. You have those who are not in the EU, but want to become the EU member states or are in NATO or want to become NATO member states. That's, for instance, uh, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, and also, I would argue, the five uh, Balkan states. And then you have a third category of states, which are the ones that don't want to become EU member states, like the United Kingdom, Norway, Liechtenstein, Iceland, and, and Switzerland. And we need to find some kind of a confederal Europe in three tiers. One, EU. Two, the applicants, I call it the European area. And three, uh, sorry, I call it the European community. And then three, the ones who don't want to join, I call them the European area. And we need to find ways of communicating and having common institutions. So it's probably too early to talk about Ukrainian NATO membership, uh, but in the long run, I would, of course, welcome them. Uh, thank you for your insight, Mr. Stubb. I, I just some more questions regarding, uh, for example, Tuesday's papers in Finland report mostly of three things, Turkish demands, NATO vote in parliament, and lions keep winning on home ice, the third and very important one. And Finland stays perfect in, uh, at the Ice Hockey World Championship, and they beat Latvia also. Did you watch the game? I watched the last period, yeah. And it, you know, I, I, it was 2-1, I think, the final score, and, and Mikael Granlund uh, scored uh, with, with, with the Latvian having a penalty. So it was an you know, important victory for Finland, but it just shows that Latvian ice hockey is very strong nowadays. But I think Finland has been in a di really difficult team for Latvia, but Latvia has also been a difficult team for us, so the last ones have been quite close. But the, the problem with home tournaments is that they are usually quite difficult to win. I mean, if you look at statistics, it's actually quite rare. But then again, uh, you know, we just won uh, gold in the Olympics by beating the Russian team, so hopefully we'll do well in this one as well. And we just got some reinforcements in form of Miro Heiskanen coming from Dallas, and he's a very strong defender. You win these tournaments actually with good goaltending and then good power play. Uh, you wrote a tweet with disappointment when Russia was allowed to wear SSSR shirts in the match against Finland last year, I guess. And what did you want to remind the Twitter public? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's an insult. I mean, CCCP is, is you know, it was an authoritarian communist regime that suppressed lots of great human beings and nation states, including Latvia, Lithuania, uh, and, and Estonia. It suppressed its satellites in the form of, you know, Poland uh, and at the time Czechoslovakia and, and Hungary. You know, it was an oppressive regime. And then to go back with some kind of, a, you know, superpower nostalgia and put down CCCCP as it is, was for us. I mean, the ice hockey team might, was great, Fetisov and Harlamov and the rest of it. But, you know, to use that as a political tool, I think, was offensive. Uh, and especially when they played with that shirt against the Czechs, uh, I didn't like it at all. Of course, I got a lot of pushback in the Russian media and even, I think, some heavyweight boxers in the Russian Duma yeah. wanting to challenge me. But, <laughs> but I think I was proved right that, you know, Russia hasn't changed, I'm afraid. I think you are strong in a golf and, and a triathlon, not in a boxing, right? Yeah, well, I used to play golf quite seriously, and now I'm a typical mammal, which is 
middle-aged man in Lycra. So I do enjoy my triathlon. I do swimming, uh, cycling, and, and running. And, and actually, yesterday, I was in London, and I had the opportunity to run with Christian Blumenfeld, who is the Olympic champion and world champion in triathlon. So that was a big dream come through for me but at the same time I was also at a seminar with Tony Blair and the former president of Estonia Kersti Kaljulain so it was a good day. It was a nice meeting. Your father was related to professional ice hockey right? Could you tell us more about your background? Yeah sure my dad uh, he's still the chief scout in Europe for the National Hockey League and he has been that since 1983 and um, actually, we're very proud of my dad. He's been doing this for 40 years. So all the European players that are in the NHL have somehow gone, uh, you know, on his laptop or on his desk. And, and he's got 10 scouts around Europe that help him out to, to siphon out talent. Of course, all the other National Hockey League teams have their own scouts as well. But my dad sort of facilitates uh, all of this. And my, my brother and I are actually going to go to the draft in Montreal in Canada uh, to watch, watch uh, the, the, for the first time for me and him to go and see my dad in action and, and, and see who the new young players are for the NHL. I don't know if there's any Latvian talent coming up, but I'm sure there is. I hope so. You are a former politician, banker, and currently the director at the European U University Institute and professor. And I saw your rather short lecture on YouTube, How to Be Happy. What is your formula? <laughs> uh, it's a good one to ask. Actually, the big YouTube thing that we have going on right now is this lecture series on understanding the war. And, and that has gone quite viral. We have uh, over a million views. They're short, 12 to 15 minute uh, lectures. But, but happiness for me is very simple. It's, it's usually based on three very basic things. Uh, by body, mind, and, and spirit, if you will. So the body basically, you know, try to stay healthy, try to sleep well, try to eat well. That makes you feel good physically. Uh, then in terms of the mind, keep on reading, keep on learning, keep on discussing, have an open mind, never be, be cynical. And then, of course, spirit, but spirit can be broader. I don't mean it in a religious sense, but I mean in the sense that you have, you know, good friends, good family relations. Uh, that usually keeps you optimistic and happy. But don't be too hard on yourself. You know, there are moments in life when things don't go the way in which you think. And, and happiness is no magic formula. I think purpose and meaning in life is important. We are on this journey together. It's a process. You know, you, you're born, you're a child, you grow older, then you're... You know, and, and at the end of the day, you want to leave the earth with a feeling that you made someone feel a little better or, or that you made uh, the world a slightly better place. None of us will succeed perfectly. So be, be gentle on yourself and you'll be much happier. Alexander Stubb, thank you very much. Kitos. My pleasure. Thanks a lot.